Good morning and thank you for joining us. My name is James Stevenson and I'm very lucky to work for the University of Florida IFAS Extension um, here in Pinellas County. We are a, um, we are a partnership with our local government. We're a partnership with Pinellas County government and we offer programs on natural resource conservation and appreciating our wild uh, native habitats here in Pinellas County. We're a very urban county. We're very built out. So what little urban or what little natural area we have, we have to take full advantage of and enjoy. So welcome to Zoom. Ha ha. I hope you're, I, perhaps you're as new to this as I am. Um, these are baby steps and we're hoping to, we are planning on offering more and more of these natural resource conservation themed uh, live programs in future. Uh, this is also being recorded. So after we edit out the um, rocky start, we'll have this available as a video. For now, um, I'm not using all the bells and whistles that Zoom has. There's a chat option where participants can ask the presenter questions and the presenter or a co-host can answer. But for now, um, if you have any questions, just jot them down and send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So for now, with that, let's get started. So backyard habitat for birds. We know that habitats are where wildlife lives. They live in various habitats and there's different kinds. There's coastal habitats, upland habitats, wetland habitats. But how do you have a habitat in your backyard? Well, habitat is basically landscaping. How you landscape your yard or whatever area of the outdoors you have sphere of influence over that's creating habitat. But landscaping is more than just the plants. It's not just what plants you choose, it's how you place them. And it's more uh, even the non-living structures that you place in your outdoor areas that constitute landscaping and also can constitute habitat. So for birds, what are the basics that birds need? Well, birds are animals and all animals need. What is he doing? Food, that's right. This is the Northern Mockingbird, perhaps a bird that even the novice could recognize with its long tail and quite feisty um, habit. So food is a number one uh, requirement for all animals and, and birds as well. Clean water, also very important. Birds need cover. So here's the same bird living or uh, occupying some cover so they can hide from predators and also build their nests so they need some place where they can hide and also access to the open air. So those are the four basics that birds require food, water, cover, and access to open air. You might want to write those down and keep them in mind as you plan on perhaps modifying your habitat area, your backyard, your landscaping for birds. So let's talk about creating a bird-friendly landscape. And this is a chorus of nestlings that are gonna guide us through today's presentation and show us how to create this bird-friendly landscape. And here are the top five tips on creating backyard habitat for birds. Number one, limit the amount of lawn that you have. Um, you might wonder how many different species of birds the residents of this house are going to observe. Uh, they haven't limited the amount of lawn that they have. And of course, this is an extreme example, but uh, Americans do tend to love our lawns, uh, but creating habitat means reducing the amount of this vast open plain. And here's a more Florida friendly uh, yard. Um, still, there's some lawn. Uh, some people require lawns for their kids to play or their dogs to run, uh, but Choose the amount of lawn that you need and choose the amount of lawn that you really need to mow. Think about that. Uh, here we have a mixture of other landscape plants providing that habitat, not only habitat, but providing you know, some lovely colors um, and uh, a way to uh, express your taste in uh, landscaping. Number two, 
leave snags in place. And snag is a word that we use in um, ecology, which refers to a dead standing tree. As long as it's safe and not uh, in immediate danger of falling down, leaving a dead tree in place provides lots and lots of habitat, not just for birds, but for the insects that fill up that dead wood. Think of all the termites and the grubs that are gonna move into a dead tree, and those in turn provide food for birds. Uh, there are cavity nesting birds, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And here, the Eastern Screech Owl is a cavity resting bird. Uh, during the day, they're very well camouflaged in a hole in this tree. So number two, leaving dead trees as long as they don't pose a, a risk to you or your family. Number three, provide water. We know that the number two need for birds is water after food, um, but the water has to be clean. So bird baths are a great thing, a fountain is a great thing, but it's very, very important to keep any water that you provide uh, for any wildlife very, very clean, especially in the summer months when the water can get very, very foul very, very quickly. So at least once a week, give your bird bath a nice scrub and refill it. Um, uh, with some nice fresh water. Number four, plant native plants. Uh, of course, our birds are adapted to our, our native birds are adapted to our native plants. Uh, this is in this case, the American beautyberry, not only providing cover, but the fruit provides food uh, for some of our migrating birds like this uh, warbler, this black throated blue warbler that, uh, you providing food and you're also providing cover uh, for this bird as it makes its treacherous trek uh, north to south during the migration. Number five, reduce pesticide use. And of course, if you're trying to garden, the caterpillar might be a scourge to your vegetable garden, uh, but caterpillars are very, very important food sources for nesting birds. Caterpillars are very nutrient dense um, and they're very soft. So this American robin is about to shove this caterpillar into her baby's mouth. It has to be soft or it's gonna hurt its baby, right? So this, these young chicks are going to receive this nutrient dense snack uh, of this caterpillar. And if we wipe out all the caterpillars uh, using pesticides, uh, if the caterpillar survives, that pesticide could be transferred onto the birds. Uh, but just if you can tolerate, especially during nesting season, that's great. Your plants should recover. So what are some other ways to create bird-friendly yards? Well, you need to manage the things that are not friendly to birds. Um, in particular, uh, the, the top causes of bird deaths uh, in, in worldwide, really, uh, but in the United States in particular, number one is going to be habitat destruction. We know that the loss of habitat leads directly to extinctions of wild animals. The number two after habitat destruction is domestic cats. And I know this is a contentious issue, but there is some extensive research that shows that the number two cause of uh, wild bird deaths are due to being killed by domestic cats. And domestic cats are not, um, they're in not in want of any food. They're generally well fed, uh, but they can't help themselves. They are uh, hunters by instinct. Um, and they'll just hunt for play. Uh, number three, of course, is building collisions, which goes hand in hand with habitat destruction because we often destroy habitat to build buildings. And so the birds that are used to going to those natural areas uh, find buildings all of a sudden and they might inadvertently fly into them. So here's a rather unpleasant slide underscoring. Uh, this is a very healthy domestic cat, obviously not hungry, uh, but just can't help itself and uh, wipe out um, local bird populations. It's a really big deal. Building collisions, here you can see an awful, almost perfect outline of an eastern screech owl uh, that was flying towards perhaps prey or perhaps some place to roost, and there happened to be a clear window in the way. One way to avoid collisions is to relocate bird feeders, maybe not quite so close to the house, maybe give them a little bit of space um, so birds don't have to zoom in um, and uh, accidentally overpass or uh, come at the bird feeder from a, a different direction and inadvertently strike the uh, glass window. 
Moving house plants, this one's kind of interesting. Of course, house plants need uh, sunlight, uh, but if you have a tree uh, sitting in the window, uh, a bird might try and fly into that tree. So just consider your placement of house plants, especially if you've had a collision in the past. Try and think about what could have um, prompted that bird to make that um, ill-fated flight. Or draw the blinds during the day. You can just draw the blinds. Um, you know, your cat at home is gonna be quite happy just sleeping under the bed. Uh, doesn't necessarily need to see outside. Um, where practical, uh, drawing the blinds creates a solid surface that the birds won't e wouldn't continue flying into. There are window decals, and there's a belief that if you put, you know, a decal of a bird of prey on a window, that that's going to do some blanket coverage. But the actual recommended distancing between decals is only a matter of centimeters. So decide if this is the kind of look that you want for your window or perhaps think of another way of preventing collisions on that window. There are products available. Uh, we don't advocate them, we haven't tested them, uh, but you could do your own research on these window films. They're kind of like the window films that they put on our mass transit buses in the county uh, where the passengers can see out, but uh, you can't see in. So here's just a couple of names. You could do your own research. And if uh, we come up with a good way of sharing the research that's been done at UF about their uh, uh, bird collision preventions, we'll certainly share that with you. So what about bird houses and bird feeders? Um, habitat also includes food as we talked about before and shelter or cover as we talked about before. We can provide these things directly uh, by putting up bird houses and bird feeders. Uh, bird houses are for what we call cavity nesting birds. So birds that are normally going to build their nest inside of a structure, usually a hollow in a tree. And here's a list of some of the birds that use cavities and will occupy man-made uh, bird houses. Uh, everything from bluebirds to kestrels, a small bird of prey, uh, flycatchers and titmice, and wrens are particularly crafty, and we'll have a look at that in just a second. For more information on um, how to create uh, these bird houses, you could turn to one of our University of Florida publications, Helping Cavity Nesters in Florida. If you go to this site, edis.ifis, dot ufl dot edu and really if you just google the word edis it's one of the first things that pops up uh, it's the electronic database of the university of florida and right here in the search if you type the word birdhouse the first fact sheet that'll pop up will be this one cavity nesters in florida it gives more details about how to create and how to place and how to clean also very important uh, these structures to attract birds like this eastern screech owl now Eastern screech owls kind of look really, really cranky uh, when they're at rest, but this is the resting cranky face. This is actually a very happy screech owl um, poking out of his uh, provided birdhouse where the, um, they actually nest once a year and successfully raise little owlets. Now I mentioned the wrens, they're not, they're not picky. Uh, here's an actual non-retouched picture of a wren that has, um, taken up residence in a shoe that someone nailed to the tree. Now, why would somebody nail a shoe to the tree? They had a little bit of prior knowledge about just how crafty wrens can be, and they predicted this would happen, and lo, it came to pass. So we'll just cover some bird feeders right quickly. Um, what do birds eat? Remember that food is the number one thing to provide to create the habitat for backyard birds. You have to think about what different birds eat. There are granivores, which means the grain-eating birds. They have these triangular beaks that are perfect for cracking through seeds. The house finch, of course, the cardinal, and the indigo bunting are a couple of the granivores that uh, we can provide grains for. Bird seed, perhaps the most commonly offered uh, bird food around, but there are others. There are frugivores, which are the fruit-eating birds, and these are the birds that you can accommodate for by planting fruiting shrubs, like the beautyberry, like the Walter's viburnum, and so on. Anything that provides the soft fruit towards the end of the year during migration would be great uh, for the frugivores, the fruit-eating birds. 
insectivores. Um, how would you provide insects? Hmm. By not using pesticides, uh, by redu re reducing your amount of pesticides, allowing a certain level of insects to uh, inhabit your habitat uh, can provide for some of these birds like the northern perula or the flicker, uh, a type of woodpecker. Um, you can also put out a tray of mealworms. Uh, I know that might be a little gross to some, but it's an, it's an option uh, to provide, again, nutrient-dense uh, uh, prey, if you will, uh, for some of these insectivores. Now, of course, they're carnivores, and so we like to, when people call up extension with um, some of their concerns about having rodents in their backyard, perhaps rodents attacking their uh, citrus trees or, or whatever, um, if you have a rodent problem, you probably have an owl deficit. So how do you provide for an owl? You put up an owl nesting box and the barred owl could help you with that uh, uh, rodent control. American kestrels are also carnivores. They're also cavity nesters. Uh, they're so small they tend to uh, feast mo mostly on insects um, and very, very small mammals. Uh, the, nor the loggerhead shrike is another carnivore. They are quite fond of uh, brown lizards, the brown anoles. So you don't really have to do much to provide for that habitat. And the nectivores, of course, the hummingbirds. Now we don't have that many hummingbirds uh, that come through Florida, but we do have a few. And providing a hummingbird feeder is certainly recommended. Uh, we do recommend following guidelines by the Audubon Society. Uh, you don't need to use any dyes in that sugar water. You do need to keep that sugar water fresh. It can spoil very, very easily, especially in our hot sun. So check with the Audubon Society about just the right way to create um, hummingbird nectar, as it's called, if you choose to put up a hummingbird feeder. So that's just a few of what birds eat. Um, but I think the birds would like to tell you that um, they're not really a substitute. Uh, they don't need bird feeders and they can do just fine without them, but it's a nice supplement. So, you know, thank you for your efforts. Remember that putting up a bird feeder can cause a slight unnatural aggregation of species. And at times of the year, you might have heard um, experts recommending taking down your bird feeders because there might be a contagious uh, disease that's being passed from bird to bird and these kind of unnatural congregations that occur at bird feeders. So the basic tube feeder is probably what we're all familiar with uh, for the seed birds, the granivores, uh, those finches and cardinals, that sort of thing, uh, where uh, there's a perch and a little hole and the birds can pick individual seeds out of the, the, uh, the, the tube that way. Another type of bird feeder uh, is the hopper feeder. And this is where you can provide for some of the more uh, fatty preferred foods like peanuts. You can put peanuts in a hopper feeder. Um, again, for some of the larger birds that feed on more nutrient dense uh, foods than the granivores. The platform feeder, and this you can put uh, a mixture of foods. So you could put, this is where you could put your mealworms. You could put some grain, you can put some larger seeds and Again, you can get um, a, a more diverse uh, array of different feeding, different uh, bird types that have different feeding habits. Now, remember that a bird feeder could also become a bird feeder. Uh, here we have a Cooper's hawk who was attracted to this unnatural congregation of smaller birds because guess what the Cooper hawk eats? Mm -hmm. The smaller songbirds. So if this happens, um, you might want to take the uh, bird feeders down for a couple of days. Uh, that Cooper's hawk would be very uh, good at learning how to recognize the bird feeders as a place for their food. And again, oh, there's a point here, uh, perhaps 10 feet from cover. Uh, the Cooper's hawk tends to hide uh, in cover until it, it, it spies an opportunity and then it swoops out and grabs the bird and it's very, very strong talons here. So just keep that in mind. Uh, also, as far as 
bird feeder placement, you want to avoid trees, obviously, because we have this arboreal rodent that is the scourge of most bird feeders. And we could do a whole webinar on how to prevent um, squirrels from coming to your bird feeder. And I'm sure as sugar that someone's going to say, I tried that and it didn't work. Squirrels are incredibly clever. So avoid trees when you're placing your bird feeders. A more natural way of providing uh, landscape plants for bird habitat that is gonna provide all the things they need uh, are uh, choosing the right plant. And so the top five landscape plants for bird habitat, live oak comes out on top. If you have the space to plant a live oak, generations after you will thank you. Um, live oaks live for almost forever. Uh, they fill up with insects. They have a very high toler tolerance for insect load caterpillar load so the birds can come in and eat to their heart's content and it doesn't harm the tree at all. Uh, the amount of cover that this, uh, these, this species provides both for nesting and for shelter is really unsurpassable. A red mulberry is an interesting native uh, fruiting tree uh, that produces fruit that um, even humans can eat, the red mulberry. Uh, and at certain times of the year, fruit is available for our migrating birds. So the, the trees time their fruiting with the time that there's an awful lot of birds coming through to ensure that their seeds will be ingested, digested, and deposited uh, to reproduce the species. So red mulberry is very fast growing. Um, don't plant it over your driveway because the mulberries tend to have a lot of pigment in them and the pigment also passes through uh, the bird's digestive system. So just be mindful if you choose red mulberry about exactly where you place it, but it would be very, very appreciated by our feathered friends. Red maple, again, another nice native uh, fast growing deciduous tree that provides wonderful cover and a really great insect load. It has another tree that can tolerate an awful lot of caterpillars and other insects without any detriment. Uh, so providing lots and lots of foods for those insectivores. Walter's viburnum is a small, uh, rather short um, evergreen flowering shrub. Uh, the flowers are very attractive to people. Um, but they produce wonderful fruit as well as, again, that insect load uh, that birds can meander through the cover of the dense branches uh, while picking um, insects from the branches. Uh, Eastern red cedar, I end with that one for the number five. The Eastern red cedar, again, is a, a conifer, but the cones are modified into these very juicy little dense, almost berry-like uh, they're not fruit, they're actually cones, but you wouldn't know it from looking at them. Uh, but the, especially the, the cedar waxwing, of course, uh, a, a big fan of the eastern red cedar. And being evergreen, it provides year-round cover, really nice, dense cover. So let's recap. I hope you wrote it down. Um, what do birds need? Number one, food. Number two, water. Number three, cover. And number four, access to the open air. Well done, y'all. Give yourselves a hand. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. I put my email up at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, my name is James Stevenson. I'm with the UF IFAS Extension, Pinellas County. And my email address, jstevenson, J-S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N, at PinellasCounty.org. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you can tune in to uh, Lara's presentation on Friday. She's gonna talk, talk to you about uh, identifying some of our common smaller birds that will be attracted to your, your backyard habitat. So thank you very much for tuning in today. I'm gonna end the meeting, and hope you all have a great day.